Hey everybody, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. Today we're talking about the fivefold ministry. You know it as the gifts found in Ephesians chapter four. We're talking about, hey, is this the, is this an office? Are these personality types or are these grace gifts? It's gonna be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. We've got an exciting program for you today talking about uh, Ephesians 4, uh, often known as the fivefold ministries, apostles, po- prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But before we dive into that today, we want to remind you that Remnant Radio is entirely crowdfunded. If you want to support the channel, help us produce the content we do here on Remnant Radio. You can give a one-time gift on PayPal, or you can give a reoccurring gift on Patreon. As those well five bucks a month, you'll get access to extra content over there on Patreon. Uh, with all that spiel out of the way, uh, I'll introduce you to the regular co-host of the show, Michael. Round trees here. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Miller is out of town, even though it's Wednesday. He's got like an who's, anniversary on, or something. Miller? Oh, who's, Basement Boy. Basement My Boy. Bad. Yes, My yes. Bad. You know him My as bad. Basement Boy. Yeah, yeah. Basement Boy's out. He's uh, he's in the Colorado doing vacation. Of course, he lives in Colorado, but he lives in like one of those states that everybody travels to for vacation vacation um so uh gonna miss basement boy today but uh anyway real excited about the program uh we are talking about as you heard at the top of the show we're talking about the ephesian 4 11 gifts or are they gifts are they offices or are they personalities and uh and we're going to talk about kind of every which way of angle uh for that so uh before we dive any deeper in the show just want to encourage you guys like this video uh, comment on it, subscribe to the channel because we have all kinds of shows coming out all the time. Uh, people are really, Josh, they are eating up this Kansas City Prophet series. Now, oh, yeah. some of them are eating it up in, in the sense that they love it. Other people, they're like watching it every week and they hate it and they're making the same comments about how they hate it every week. But most people are really liking it and uh, everyone is finding it extremely informative about a pretty recent season in church history in which some supernatural phenomena seem to be taking place. So that's every Tuesday uh, with Dr. Sam Storms. And um, uh, But next week, Monday, we have Daryl Bach coming on the show. And uh, Dr. Bach is a pretty prolific author, scholar uh, out of Dallas Theological Seminary. So you guys are going to want to make sure you hit that subscribe button. So mm-hmm. um, Anyway, without further ado, let's uh, let's dive in, Josh. How should we start? You think we should maybe we should read the passage? Yeah. What we'll probably do is we'll read the passage. We'll kind of try to do some, I guess, w- 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 exegetical work on the passage itself. Some some light work. Just explain where is the difficulty with the passage. How are people understanding this? And then we'll kind of go through the primary ways of interpreting the text. Um, the the we'll go with offices first. We'll go with personality second, and then we'll finish up with grace gifts third. Uh, do you want to read the passage for us, Michael, and then we can kind of discuss some of the interpretive yeah, uh, hurdles sure. that come with it? Sure. Yeah, so we'll start in verse 7. So Paul has just been uh, making the argument that the Ephesians, like, you're, you are one. There's one baptism, one, uh, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. So make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So he's talking about unity, but now he's going to talk about unity in the uh, unity through diversity. And, uh, and so he starts to kind of shift in verse 7 toward that direction. And he says, but, so that's how you know it's a new, new direction, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, he's going to quote Psalm 68, 18, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, uh, that he might fill all things. And here is probably we're going to we're going to spend the most of the time today. Verse eleven, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So you see that word unity. He's just talked about a diversity of gifts, but now. The, their ultimate aim is the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, which incidentally, almost everybody's going to say that hasn't been attained yet. Has the universal church attained the 
the full stature, the measure, or the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Almost everybody's going to say no. Well, what does that mean? That means that uh, the highly debated prophets and apostles should be expected to continue until the church reaches that complete and total full maturity, which it will before Jesus returns because Jesus is coming back for a bride who's ready. And apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are part of how God equips and prepares his bride to be ready for his return. So just Amen. a little continuationism plug there. Um, but yeah, uh, Josh, do you want to start into exegetical hurdles or you want to, you want me to well, talk? Well, let me, let me just uh, kind of catch up the audience here. Um, Paul quotes uh, uh, a psalm here. Is it Psalm 68, Michael? It's he who ascended mm -hmm. in the lower regions of the earth. Is he who ascended on high and gave gifts to men? Um, yep. uh, that passage, uh, you believe it to be more of a typological sort of quote, right? Maybe you should unpack that for us. Yeah, yeah. So biblical typology. Um, and I was just talking with some of the leaders in our church to, uh, this week and, um, and teaching on this subject, but what is typology? And basically, it's the idea that the Old Testament is filled with types and shadows that point to the substance which is found in Christ. So it might be about uh, an institution like the, the temple and temple worship, uh, which uh, ultimately points, you know, the temple becomes the church it, 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 or the sacrificial system points to Jesus' sacrifice. It might be a person like there's David, but then there's the greater David who's Jesus. Moses, but then the greater Moses. Adam, but the greater Adam. So in each of these, you see uh, that in the Old Testament, there was like this shadow, it'd be, it would be called a type pointing to the anti antitype, which is fulfilled in Jesus or sometimes fulfilled in Jesus' new mystical covenant. body, which is the church or fulfilled in the new covenant. And, and what you see is there has to be both analogy and escalation. And so uh, escalation, like I was saying, there's a greater David, the greater sacrifice and so on. Analogy means there has to be some kind of connection. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one perfect connection. In fact, it won't be because, you know, since Jesus is so much greater than the first Adam, I mean, the first Adam sinned, that's, the second Adam didn't. So, th so already it's not a one-to-one -one perfect uh, analogy, but it is still analogous. And so where Adam was the first man over creation and Jesus uh, the first man over new creation. And, and there are multiple other analogies too. So... It has to be analogous. It can't be like the Song of Solomon where you have, um, you, you know, where some like medieval interpreters would be like, oh, the woman's two breasts represent the Old and New Testament. It's like, wait, what? Where's the analogy there? And, and what you see throughout the scripture, uh, the New Testament, and the way the apostles interpret the Old Testament is they, they interpret it as types and shadows. And so, for instance, where David is writing about uh, in Psalm 68, it's a, it's a psalm about victory, and it's a psalm about the ark ascending from Sinai to Zion is this great mark of victory, and about uh, as part of the hallmark of this victory, captives being taken and gifts being given to men in the context of this great victory over enemies. Now, nobody, honestly, with, without sort of apostolic eyes, without that apostolic hermeneutic, we might not have naturally read that psalm and said, oh, that's clearly about Jesus. But Paul read it and said, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's about Jesus. And it's about uh, just that Jesus is the sort of greater ark of the covenant. He became our propitiation, which basically is the mercy seat, same word, okay? So uh, just as the ark ascend, went from Zion, the place of law, to, uh, or did I say Sinai, the place of the law, to Zion, um, Jesus also ascended to the, uh, you know, so he went from law, he was born under law, and, and took us to sort of gospel to Mount Zion. So, so he seems to be... Uh, uh, the point Paul is making is that there, there's analogy here in the ascent of the ark, but it's a, a greater ascent because it's the ascent of the Son of God into heaven at the right hand of the Father. And in that process, he gave gifts to men. Just like in the Old Testament, there was plunder distributed in the victory. In the New Testament, what he's saying, uh, under this new covenant, Jesus distributed gifts 
namely spiritual gifts, uh, where he'll say in Ephesians 4, 7, to each one was given the, the measure of Christ's gift. So uh, anyway, so there's a little bit of a lesson in biblical typology. Josh, did I miss anything? No, I, I think that we need to ask the question, though, why is that important? Because the gifts that were given in the Psalm passage uh, seems to be those who were set at liberty. Was it, is it the plunder that was taken from the enemy that is now delivered over into the hands of uh, God's covenant people? And, and that, that type doesn't perfectly match this kind of, mm-hmm. this new, uh, this new fullness. I mean, uh, uh, David McGuire in the comment section has, has frequently said that the shame of Michael Roundtree on the show was like a type. And then like when he shaved his beard, the fullness of that type was manifest. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Really Would that be an that? accurate way of understanding really types and anti No, oh. I totally put that in his mouth. He, he's oh, been giving a lot about your you. beard though. Uh. Oh, <laughs> That was funny. A lot of people are still trying to get used to this beardless face of mine. It's um, okay. Yeah, I, I'm getting used to it. I like look at myself on the screen. I'm like, whoa, I'm 12. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, but, you know, Josh, to your point about typology, and that's the key where it doesn't have to be a one-to-one connection. So, uh, you know, like take Solomon in 2 Samuel 7. Um, there are things said about Solomon, like he's going to be punished and, and so on, which would never apply to Jesus in the same way that it applied to, to Solomon because Jesus didn't have any sin to be punished for. Now, Jesus was punished for our sin. Uh, that's penal substitutionary atonement right there. But um, the, the point is that it's, it's usually not a perfect, or it's never a perfect analogy because of that escalatory component. So... Um, Anyway, so yeah, the fact that, you know, there, so taking Psalm 68, for instance, Josh, if there's plunder taken from enemies and distributed, it's not like Jesus, by way of analogy, is stealing from, say, Satan, sin, and death, our enemies, spiritual gifts to then give to the church. That's kind of pressing the typology too far. It's a type, it's, it's a shadow. It's not meant to be like that uh, that precise in all the details is this one-to-one literal analogy. D- doesn't, isn't there uh, interpretations of Ephesians 4 that say something to the effect of the plundering that took place was the uh, Abraham's bosom and he descended in the lower regions of the earth and set at liberty those who were deemed righteous by faith, like Abraham, David, these others that were deemed righteous by faith. They, they ascended with him into heaven and it's his session on on the uh, on the on the mercy seat if you will it's it's the the enthroned christ that he now mediates his ministry as prophet priest and king through the church so we i think you and i both agree that the the mediated work of christ the gifts that are given is that these are office these are office these are works of christ fulfilling his ministry as prophet priest and king through the whole church right we agree on that mm-hmm. but yeah. that that interpretation of what is being plundered is kind of debated amongst scholars uh, yeah, there is some debate. And part of what, what you said about uh, whenever you talked about going into the lower regions, uh, the earth, uh, I'm trying to trying to remember the, let me, here's a verse. Uh, this is verse nine. In saying he ascended, what does it mean that he also d- descended into the lower regions of the earth? Uh, there are a number of different um, takes on this, and, and it's kind of a translational difficulty. Is he saying the lower region of the earth? Um, like the grave, is he, uh, uh, throughout a part, <clears throat> excuse me, part of the early church, a lot of people took this as like he, Jesus's descent into hell. And I think that's what you're referring to. Um, I, I, yeah, so there are a number of different interpretations, uh, of this and part of it's based on a translational difficulty in verse nine. Okay, excellent. So let's 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 move on into the the meat and potatoes of our discussion today, as we're talking primarily about the gifts of the Spirit, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists. We read from the ESV, which has shepherds and teachers. Uh, other translations will say pastor. It is probably important that people know that the word pastor used here in Ephesians four. This is the only time the word pastor is used in the New Testament. Um, so it, it it seems odd and interesting to me. So people go, well, why is this conversation relevant today? Well. We use the word pastor all the time, basically for everyone who is in any form of leadership anywhere. And we use the word pastor. And yet the one time it's used in the New Testament, it's not really defined and explained. And we don't see like an act of a pastor 
like operating in in the book of Acts or uh, in Galatia or in First Corinthians. Like we, we don't see a display of that gift being exercised, and yet we apply it to anyone who's in any form of leadership. You've got a children's pastor. You've got a worship pastor. You got a you've got a creative arts pastor. You've got an online pastor. You know, pastor. You got all these guys that are doing mm-hmm. things with that title. So it's important that when we read this, we try to remove our kind of Western context when we're trying to read this passage. Um, right. And there's a lot of different ways that this passage has been has been read. I, I was raised in a classical Pentecostal church, and when I was in that classical Pentecostal church, the primary way that I understood this text, I can't even say that everyone agreed on exactly the way this operated, but I think that the vast majority of individuals would say, hey, these are five offices, right? The apostle, he's going to plant the church. Your prophet is going to like figure out the vision of your church, exactly how you guys are going to operate. Oh, you know, the prophet has said that we're going to reap a harvest if we do evangelism over there, or if we start a prayer movement here, or if we whatever. So like the prophet helps get like uh, uh, insight on the church and the church kind of follows what the prophet says. Your evangelist reads, leads all of your outreach. Your pastor leads all of your, your counseling and outreach or not your outreach, your, your, your counseling and cares ministries, your teacher educates and trains. And they view these things as kind of official positions in the church. And, um, I even remember writing something a long time ago about, uh, fivefold ministry as God's, you know, ordained offices and that we've rejected those offices and we'd rather have, senior pastors, associate pastors, youth pastors, children's pastors, and worship leaders for the equipping of the saints. Uh, and I wrote something once upon a time that was rather, <laughs> that was rather uh, indicting uh, because I was really all in on this idea of offices. Michael, do you have any like initial thoughts on that? Like when you read Ephesians 4, do you think we should be understanding these as offices? Why or why not? What would yeah. be your initial hang you, up to that? You know, I, I think I'm actually now maybe coming back to one of the things that were I think you were getting at with with your earlier question about uh, a discrepancy or a difficulty or a debate amongst some scholars, and that is that Ephesians four seven sounds like uh, the gifts are uh, are the spiritual gifts given to God's people, but Ephesians four eleven sounds like the people themselves are the gifts. Sure. Is that one of the things you were trying to draw out of me there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was one of those things because it's like uh, it says that he gave gifts to men, and then what gifts did he give? some to be apostles, some to be prophets. It sounds as if exactly. the, the individual is what is being given in Ephesians 4, opposed to a manifestation of the Spirit that's typically give, given in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So this is one of the arguments that would be for the office position. They would say, look, it's a person being given, not a manifestation of the Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, okay, absolutely. Well, um, so when we come to this debate about like office versus gift, I think um, I don't think that it's like perfectly resolvable because I I think when you look at um, I mean for one verses seven to eleven and seven sounds like it is talking about spiritual gifts and verse eleven sounds like it is talking about the people themselves being the gifts. So verse eleven could sound more officey and verse seven could sound more gifty and um, Man, Josh, I, I think for me, when it comes to offices, I feel real comfortable with elders and deacons being Amen. offices in the church. I feel way less comfortable than with saying that these other fivefold are offices. Now, with a possible exception of apostle, now it's like once you let in an exception, it's like, ah, we're all coming at, you know, so like, um, but apostleship aside, because I think that merits its own discussion. Um, I. I feel uncomfortable with it because time and again, you see like, uh, I think it's to the Philippians where he says to the elders and the deacons of Philippi and, uh, and to, in first Timothy three, he's setting out the standards for here's the case for elders and here's the case for deacons. And just because somebody gets a prophecy, like that doesn't mean that like they get to be the boss of the elders. That's just like a scary thought. Or do we want the evangelist because he's a gifted evangelist and he's a trainer equipper to be the boss of the elders? Uh, I mean, First Timothy five seventeen, the elders are to direct the affairs of the church. Um, so I feel much more comfortable, Josh, with saying that the offices of the church are elder and deacon. And then might somebody be called a prophet? Might somebody be called an evangelist? Yes, I think that's definitely the case. But I don't see indication in Ephesians chapter 4 of governmental authority. Uh, 
And, and just because someone will say, well, but look, these people are training and equipping the other saints. If somebody trains and equips, does that mean they have governmental authority in the church? I don't think necessarily. Uh, now, we would have there are times, an example. An example of that would be like Michael and I might have a lady teaching a Sunday school class, but she's not an elder in the local church. She's not exercising church discipline. Let's say someone is an unrepentant sin. You know, she's not one of the elders to get together and say, hey, we're going to cut this person off from the table in our local congregation. Right. So this person can be equipping the saints and a gift empowered by the Holy Spirit. Right. Priscilla and Aquila went to teach Apollos more accurately the scripture. But, you know, Aquila uh, was not present for the, the deliberation of, of certain doctrines or whether the Gentiles were to be allowed into uh, the, the Jewish church, uh, what, what laws they were going to have to follow and what laws they weren't going to have to follow. Uh, this was not part of that kind of uh, organizational structure. Uh, it doesn't violate 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, which explicitly says don't allow women to preach, teach, or exercise authority. So we have a woman who is able to teach, empowered to teach by God's Spirit, Ephesians 4, uh, and then is able somehow not to violate uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And those things can be consistent. Here, here's one of the arguments, though, Michael, is that the difference, but there's a difference between the gift of prophecy and the gift or the office of a prophet. And what they'll say is, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, or even let's go to Joel 2 and, and Acts 2, and it says, he'll pour out his spirit on all uh, his sons and daughters will prophesy, right? Old men, young men, dreams and visions, all these things on his male and female servants in those days, he'll pour out his spirit, right? So this, this big kind of uh, prophetic encounter where God's going to speak directly to his people. And they'll say, look, everyone has access to hear from God. But those who teach people how to hear from God, those are the people who are prophets. So they're, they're going to make this distinction between the gift of prophet or the gift of prophecy and the office of a prophet. And the, the distinction that they're going to make there is that the equipping that you're equipping them to do prophecy. What would you what would you say to that? Yeah, I would just say there's there's just no evidence for that. I mean, the fact that equipping is mentioned of prophets in Ephesians 411. Yes, that's true. And but that all that tells me is that at least some prophets are designed by God for equipping ministry. Does that mean all prophets are designed by God for equipping ministry? I can't imagine that's the case because Acts chapter two says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, which is all believers. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So you're telling me that our, our little children who are prophesying like that, you know, if my eight year old gets dreams about Jesus and prophetic words for people, which is what that text means is that young people are going to be getting prophetic messages. And of course you have the example in the old Testament for Samuel, Samuel chapter three with, uh, with Samuel when he's a boy growing up in the temple. Okay. So are we saying that little boys and little girls should have governmental authority for training and equipping and prophecy in the church? It it's, it's a distinction that they're, they're making too much out of Ephesians 4.11. Now, I do believe, and I don't know if we entirely agree on this, Josh, I do believe that um, Paul singles out these five, and some will say four, uh, because the last one is uh, uh, the wording of the verse precisely is God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, as though the last two go together. Which, which makes sense, uh, pastoring and teaching being sort of matched together. Um, so some would call it a fourfold. But either way, fourfold, fivefold, 4.5fold, I don't care what you want to call it, um, that there are, uh, gosh, Josh, I lost my train of thought. Here, I'll I can jump out. back in. I, I can jump back in. That's yeah. fine. Uh, I'll just say for people who are, who are just not coming in, how does this make sense? There's no difference between the office of a prophet and the gift of prophecy. There is no difference. That is an an unhelpful, unnecessary distinction. What will happen is someone will say, hey, Ephesians uh, 4 prophets, the difference is that they are there to equip the saints for work of ministry. I would just say, okay, what if a child came up to Michael and this was a year and a half ago and they gave a prophetic word that he was going to move Texas from Texas and he was going to go to Oklahoma and pastor a church there in Oklahoma. And Michael goes, that seems odd. That seems weird. And then there's an offer uh, to go to Oklahoma and that that prophetic word given by a child, you know, uh, given by some random person make uh, him in an the elder, congregation and, and it's affirmed. <laughs> Wait, say again. I said, make him an elder, dude. Make him an elder. Yeah. So what we're saying is the gift. Look at how that gift equipped Michael for the work of ministry. You see how that, that gift equipped him and he didn't have to be an elder to equip him. It's just the gift itself equips. So what is a prophet? It's just a person who exercises the gift of prophecy frequently. 
right? What is a teacher? It's just a person who frequently exercises the gift of teaching. Now, you don't have to be in an official position in your local church to exercise those gifts. Uh, if I'm a teacher in the church, I don't have to be teaching people how to teach. No, if I'm teaching them how to read their Bible, I'm teaching them about penal substitutionary atonement, I'm teaching them about the Trinity, I'm teaching about them who, who, who Christ is and his divinity and in his humanity, and I'm explaining these doctrines, I'm equipping them to carry that gospel out, right? So am I teaching them how to teach? No, but am I teaching them how to read their Bible? Yes, and that equips them for ministry. And so I think that this idea that teachers are supposed to teach teachers how to teach and prophets are supposed to teach prophets how to prophesy this it, it, it creates a too narrow of an interpretation of Ephesians 4 that I don't think is necessary. I think pastors yeah. can train prophets. I think prophets can train pastors. Uh, or I say train. I use that word, but I meant to say equip. I think they, could, they can equip them in their various gifts. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and I agree with that. I just, Like I said, I would agree with you. It's too narrow of, a, of an interpretation of Ephesians 4.11. Uh, where, where I did want to go with it was I, I do think that of those four or five, that there is uh, some sort of special equipping ministry, at least for some of them, right? So I'm not saying every single prophetically gifted individual is called to be a trainer and equipper in the body of Christ. Uh, but he doesn't, uh, and it could be random, that's definitely a possibility, but it does seem that there is a kind of reason why he would choose these. It's kind of similar to um, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, where he says God gave first apostles, second uh, prophets, and I think it's third teachers, if I remember right. And, um, and then it goes on and it lists some more and then this and then that and then that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean when he says first, second, third, that doesn't mean that he's talking about authority, because it, it's doubtful that he would put prophets as authoritative over teachers. Um, because we know that elders are the ones who are to uh, direct the affairs of the church, and they're the principal teachers of the church as well. So it's doubtful in that he's really talking about authority. Probably he's talking about priority, the priority of the gifts in the body of Christ. And uh, it, insofar as prophecy is concerned, he'll go on. Uh, just a few verses later and extol prophecy is to be uh, especially pursued. So um, so I, I do think that given the similarity of that to Ephesians 4.11 and the, and the type of list there, there seems to be in my mind some kind of priority and some kind of equipping ministry associated with these. But I think it's going too far to say every single person who's gifted in prophecy, every person who's gifted in evangelism is called not just to do it, but to equip others and hold workshops and have classroom settings. But they're not here. making that argument. They're, they're making the opposite argument. They're saying if you're out there prophesying, great, that doesn't make you a prophet. The only people who are prophets are people who are teaching people to prophesy. That's the distinction they're making. They're not saying because you can prophesy, you should equip people. They're saying only okay. prophets can equip people. I would just say that's a misreading of the text. I would say that if, if you are prophesying to an individual, that is equipping them, right? Like it's equipping them to hold on to, hey, like when times get rough, Michael Roundtree has got 13 prophetic words that he was supposed to go to Bridgeway, right? And when, you know, the inevitable bad situation happens, the difficult situation, Thanks, the bro. trial. Thanks for predicting that. You're you know, not a prophet, bro. I'm not a prophet. I'm, I'm just quoting Jesus. Trials come <laughs> on account of being his follower. And, and some trial um, emerges and Michael is questioning, man, should I have taken that job? Well, he's going to have all of this, yeah, this this equipping that took place that, that well, gives him that strength to carry on. I, I don't 100 percent disagree with you, but I to me, I think you're too much conflating equipping with edifying and and they are two different words. And uh, because he's going to go on later in the text and he say he tell, he'll tell us what they're equipping them for. And he's equipping them for edifying. He's equipping they're equipping the rest of the body to do works of ministry that edify the rest of the body. So I, I don't I don't feel as great, Josh, about saying like, if I simply prophesy, I'm equipping the body in the precise way that that Paul was talking about right here. I think that's conflating a little bit too much. Okay, so let, let's just apply this to another one. If I'm if I'm training you and am I teaching you, I'm just teaching you the Bible. Do you think that equips you for ministry? 
Like if I'm teaching you the foundations of scripture, do you think that equips someone for ministry? Yeah. So, I mean, the answer is yes. And I think, uh, and so I I think what I'm trying to say is I, like, for instance, at Bridgeway, we just, we demonstrate prophecy on a weekly basis from the stage. And I think merely in practicing a gift, even if it's not accompanied by instruction, not only edifies, but also equips. And I think that's the point you're making. So I actually do agree with you. I just think Paul is talking about something more than that. And, uh, and I think that just because of the wording of he's, uh, uh, because of the way he seems to single these out, because of the way it seems in terms of priority seems to match with first Corinthians chapter 12, uh, that that's that's all I'm saying, but I, I will give you this, Josh. I, I think it's debatable, and I I think it could go either way. I just tend to lean that that equip means something that goes a little bit beyond just edifying. Yeah, and and I think what would be important though is if we kind of looked at the texts of scripture that talk about prophets in the New Testament. Um, you know, we've got the passage of Agabus um, in Acts 11, I believe it is. He predicts that there is going to be a big drought, uh, but in Acts 11, he just says, "Hey, this is my prediction." And what does the church do? The church decides to uh, save up money, to save up goods. And then they set up Paul and Barnabas to go do, uh, to go deliver those goods to the church of Jerusalem, right? Um, It's as if there is a preparation in expectation, right? Uh, Agabus didn't say, hey guys, this is what's going to happen. Therefore, this is what you should do, right? He just told them what he had received. And the church weighed that word in accordance of 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22, and in accordance with 1 mm-hmm. Corinthians 14, 29, right? That they're to judge, let one prophet speak, let the others weigh what is being said. So if they're weighing a prophetic word of a prophet, what other authority does he have that's different than a child uh, or the daughters of Philip that, that give a prophetic word? All of these things are to be judged and weighed. So a prophet doesn't have any kind of extra biblical authority. They don't have any extra authority than an average congregate would. Uh, there's they no don't. there's no governing authority that we see from the prophets listed in the New Testament. Uh, but right. additionally to that, I would just say, what kind of equipping do we see those prophets doing? I, I don't see any kind of, um, and maybe there is a pro- a kind of equipping that's not being mentioned in the text. But but again, I feel like we are then grasping for straws on what that equipping is precisely. Um, I guess my point was primarily not that prophecy doesn't that all prophecy equips. That wasn't necessarily my point, though I, I think I still think that's true. I would just say that the kind of equipping of other prophets or other people on how to prophesy is an unnecessary distinction. Does okay. that seem fair? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, Josh, I think we're like 99% on the same page on this. Um, I think one one big difference, or kind of what we're drilling toward is, is there a plain difference between the one who has the gift of prophecy and the office of prophet biblically? And I think for both of us, the answer is no. And this distinction that like, well, if you have the office, you're an equipper. um, We don't actually see that. We don't see that anywhere. Uh, I mean, the closest we get is Ephesians 4.11 because it uses equip in the context of prophesying. Um, But it doesn't suggest that every single person who is a prophet also is an equipper. And when we look at the way prophecy is practiced throughout the book of Acts, so, so the story of the early church, and we don't actually see that at all. We just see people prophesying. And uh, we, we don't see sons and daughters labeled like this capital P prophet or anything. Uh, Josh, I think here's though part of the problem, and I think we're going to have to visit this apostle thing, um, and, and maybe pastor teacher also. Um, because when we think about pastor teacher, we tend to think elder. That's what we tend to think. And there are some reasons for that. You know, Paul will tell, like in the verb form of it, Acts chapter 20, uh, that that elders are to shepherd the flock amongst them. Um, 1 Peter 5 says the same thing, that elders are to shepherd. So it's kind of like this verb form of pastoring. So even though we don't see the noun, we do see the verb, and it's associated with eldership. So eldership is an office. So people think office there, and then uh, they associate teaching with that too. And then we have apostle that's typically thought of as an office. So Josh, what would you say to this? Like, hey, we've got close correlations between pastor and teacher and offices throughout the rest of the New Testament. Uh, we have close correlations, if not a total correlation, between apostleship and uh, being an office in the New Testament. Why won't we just throw, throw our lot in with prophet and evangelist and say, okay, it seems like this is a list of offices 
uh, that are authoritative. If somebody was going to push back on us with that kind of argument, what would you say? Well, I would just say, like I said earlier, that there are people that teach in the Bible who aren't qualified to be elders biblically. Um, so the teaching gift doesn't isn't exclusive to elders. I think anyone can be graced with a teacher gift. Um, I think a child reaching their their friends and family could could be graced to reach people through teaching God's word. Um, next, I would say that the qualifications for an overseer are based off of character and competency and not off of giftedness, right? So uh, when I go to 1 Timothy um, chapter 3 and it talks about the qualifications for an overseer, we have competency and character that are there defining what that role of a leader is. Here, these gifts don't determine oversight. And that's that's my primary problem with lo looking at these things as, as offices, because someone comes in with a deep prophetic gift and suddenly they have the reins of the church because they hear directly from God. And, and though we have a passage that clearly says you'll know a prophet by their fruit, um, frequently there is excuses made for their competency. Oh, this person, yeah, he's the leader of our church because he hears directly from God. He can't exegete himself out of a wet paper sack, but because he hears from God, he's the leader of our church. Well, it's like, well, now you've you've set up a person to lead you because they're gifted, not because they're competent. And again, I would say that the primary qualifications for leadership in the local church are characters and competency. Uh, and then, you know, there's also gender roles and other things like that that are that are packaged within the text itself. But if we look just at gifting, we're going to get in trouble. So we should look at character competency as elders and, and deacons for those positions. Uh, and then secondly, I would just yep. say that we see tons of people exercising these gifts, prophecy, teaching, uh, shepherding, that aren't uh, elders uh, or, or deacons in the local church. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I and I think, Josh, what I would say is that to make these positions authoritative, which when we talk about office versus gift, that's really what we're talking about. The people who want to make these five-fold offices are, are wanting to make these authoritative. Um, and especially, and there's almost kind of like a ranking, it tends to be like the apostle is the number one authority, and that's usually like the CEO of the church, with the prophet being sort of a close second. And um, maybe that's like the executive pastor who has some kind of relatory gift too. <laughs> and then uh, and then the elders, and there are usually elders in these kinds of churches, but they're usually a board of businessmen who kind of meet every now and then, decide some things about the facility and that kind of thing. But the reality is um, it's the CEO apostle who's calling the shots. And so people look at Ephesians 4.11 and they try to make this about church governance, but the obvious passage about for church governance. I mean, there's Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 that speak of mm -hmm. eldership. Uh, I'm not saying those are the only passages, uh, but from an, uh, uh, the perspective of the epistles, where we have just the clearest sort of didactic, here is what church governance is supposed to look like. I mean, you have a story in Acts 15, but I'm talking about Paul just saying, here is church governance. He doesn't mention fivefold. Uh, he mentions eldership and he mentions deacons. And it, to your point, it's character, 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 character. Eh, they should probably be able to teach character, character, character. You know, when we get to Ephesians 4, he's talking about gift, 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 gift. And yes, ultimately character, the gifts are meant to build us up in love. So to grow us into spiritual maturity, but he's not talking about character as a prerequisite but rather a goal in Ephesians chapter four, which tells me this is about gifts because the goal of the gifts is to build up love. But if you want to make these about, if you, if you want to make these into offices, which means you want these to have authoritative power, you have to be able to say, how does this jive with what Paul has said right. elsewhere about church governance, first of all? And second of all, and this is far worse, you have to actually read church governance into the text because there is absolutely nothing about church governance in this passage. Now, Michael, let me ask you a question, because I think that we both agree on this as well. Uh, you've got a group of qualified elders at your church uh, defined by character and competency, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're elders. Now, some of them, I would imagine, are gifted in prophecy. I would imagine others are gifted in pastoral ministry. Others are gifted in healing, tongues, interpretation. Like, I would imagine that you have a plural, you probably even have apostolic people on your team. So you have elders that are determined by the qualifications set in Ephesians, not Ephesians, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but those elders that are determined by character and competency 
also have some of the gifts listed in Ephesians 4, or maybe even all of the gifts in Ephesians 4 are represented in your elder team. Uh, is, mm -hmm. is that also true? Uh, yeah, for sure. I can, I can think of people probably across the board on this fivefold that, uh, uh, amongst my elder board now, and that does kind of beg another question. Cause I have heard of churches that do this, Josh, where they're, they're trying to get a full fivefold representation on their elder board. So they actually have a, a proper biblical governance of eldership, not just deciding a few random facility things, but actually governing, overseeing, shepherding the church, not as hirelings, not as just outside, not as just policy makers, but as people who will lay down their life are intimately involved in the life of the church and proclaiming the full counsel of God, etc. But they're trying to make sure that there's a diversity and giftedness, and especially in the fivefold. I don't personally have a problem with that. I, th I think sure, there can be you? Get like a beauty and a, and a goodness to that. I, so I think that's cool. I think my one warning would be uh, that if if you do do that, then you have to be careful about ranking people on the elder board in accordance with their supposed fivefold anointing, right? Agreed. So I I would be real careful about, well, yeah, we have an elder board, but um, the, we have like one this one guy on the elder board who's the senior pastor, he's the apostle. And well, we just make sure he's not doing anything too stupid, but basically you're rubber stamping him. That happens way more often than you would think. Um, so, so it's like on paper, it, it looks acceptable, but the, it's just really hard when somebody takes on that title apostle, it's really hard for it to not take the form of boss man, CEO in charge and just needs a rubber stamp from his elder board. And, and that, that just because it looks like a proper elder board on paper in, in reality is not. Yeah, you, you, but that's the same way that it is in every church. You have a Baptist church that says, hey, we have a plurality of elders. But then when you really get in there, there's one guy who's got the CEO model and he's got a bunch of guys he's voted yep. in that are all yes men. So there, that's mm -hmm. definitely a potential abuse in all contexts, specifically when you take on the title apostle with the biblical context of apostolic ministry. You can have a lot of people just kind of shaking their head being yes men. I want to talk about personalities because yeah. I feel like we need to we need to move on into that because we've kind of sure. I feel like addressed the offices things and we need to move into personalities. If you guys are familiar at all with Alan Hirsch, he's come on the show before. I like Alan. He's a uh, church growth, church statistics kind of guy. Like that's what he does. It's his bread and butter. And he goes into you know non denominational churches, a lot of mainline churches, Methodist, Anglican, Lutheran, like a lot of those mainline churches in preaches Ephesians 4, like that's his text, right? And he came up with this acronym APEST, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Shepherd, Teacher, APEST. And he'll talk about how these are character types, that there are people in our church who really love to connect with God. They're the prophetic people. There are people who love entrepreneurial work. Those are uh, apostles. There are people who really just bleed for people. They just, they feel what they feel. They're very compassionate. Those are our pastors. Some who are interested in education, some people who are interested in meeting new people, those are evangelists, right? So he just, he, he reduces all of the fivefold ministries into personality types. And I've actually found this one. Um, I like Alan. Alan, you've been on the show. No disrespect. I dislike this so much. I, I, I cannot stand it. So, because what happens again from experience is that people begin to look, they, they begin to make ex, uh, excuses for their character. Like I've seen prophets, you know, be jerks or evangelists be jerks to people in the body of Christ and be like, oh, well, you know, I'm not a pastor. And they reduce it to this personality type thing that I think is just way off and walky. Uh, it's funny because we do that with like actual personality tests. Well, I'm an introvert. Right. Like you discover, you take the test, you discover you're an introvert and suddenly like you never do anything. You like locked in your room, like you. So you allow this like personality test to box you in. It's like the same thing can't happen. Now, I think Alan would push back on you, Josh, and he would say, "Well, just because this is abused doesn't mean that that's the way God intended it." What would you say to Alan if he said that? Well, I would just say that the Bible actually tells us which gifts to desire. So let's just say that if is it my internal desire that determines where my gifting is? Like maybe I 
I desire to connect with God or I desire to connect with people. That That's not at all how we're supposed to determine spiritual gifts. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us to pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that we prophesy. So he says prophecy is supposed to take a priori um, position in our desires. Well, if that's the case, then we should all be prophets, right? Well, our desire to do something shouldn't affect that. Secondly, I would say that our culture informs our passions and our desires. And I'll give you an example. I, I went to Heartland World Ministries Church, right? And Steve Hill was the pastor. Can you imagine what potential gift was elevated above every other gift in that context? Evangelism, right? This guy was a world known evangelist. And yet, prophecy, he would talk about it, but he's like, that's not really important. What's important is souls, right? Pastoral ministry, yeah, we want to care for the sheep, but we're, we're here for souls. You got to destroy the works of the devil, the kingdom of darkness. Let's go out and do souls. So, I was gifted as in teaching from, from early on in that whole Bible school space, um, in, in going into public high schools and teaching. But I never, and I tell you, it had to have been six or seven years. I think recently I've had more fruit in this, but like seven years of doing evangelism, going out on the streets, because that was, they told me that was the important thing and I burned for it and I had a desire for it. But I never one time was graced, supernaturally empowered to reap a harvest. I just planted seed, right? God, God watered, uh, you know, uh, someone, someone else watered, God caused the growth, right? But I never saw someone coming to faith. I wasn't harvesting souls. Where I found the most grace was in teaching, but I didn't want to even like that gift because it wasn't valued in my community. So if we look at our desires as, you know, something that is supposed to help us determine our gifting, well, one, the scripture tells us what our desire should be, so that's not helpful. And then secondly, our culture informs our desires so that would be unhelpful as well. We'll all find if we go to a Bible church that we're all teachers, or if we go to a hyper charismatic church, we're all prophets and apostles somehow. Um, so I don't think that that's helpful either. Does that, is that yeah. enough pushback there, Michael? Yeah, no, I think that's good. I, you know, I appreciate what Alan's trying to do. And what he's trying to do is say, hey, we've been so pastor teacher focused in the West for so long. Let's make space for the fullness of mm -hmm of what God offers us, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, not just pastor, teacher. And so he's trying to make space in it. And to that, I think Josh and I would say yes and amen. And he's also doing a little bit of trailblazing because the church has has not entered into these spaces. But uh, it, enough, but it, it really, especially since the early church. And uh, once, once Christianity became the sort of accepted religion in the Roman Empire, it's like the spiritual gifts seem to go uh, a lot more underground, particularly uh, apostle, prophet, and we got to talk more about apostle. We'll probably have to say that for a future episode, Josh. But uh, apostle, prophet, and some and some of these other sometimes so-called uh, sign gifts. But I appreciate what he's trying to do. I just feel like we're on safer ground if we just call them gifts, uh, because because to your point, Josh, when Paul tells us to eagerly desire prophecy, it wouldn't make sense if this was really like if this was a artsy personality gift, like eagerly desire that you might be more creative and artsy, you know, like, wait, what, what exactly does that mean? And, um, and then it saves us from, I'll tell you, I'm way more described. artistic than you and Michael put you and Michael put together. I, I can literally are, draw dude. circles. I can, draw it. I can draw circles fact, around you guys. Can I show y'all something? Can I show yeah. you guys something? Go ahead. Okay. All right. This behind me, this is the pot that I made Wow. in, in ninth grade. Right there, that's yes. a stud. Can you read yes. that? Yes, because you'd have to be yeah. to make something like that. And and that that says buff. So buff here's stud. Here's here's so the thing. That, that, you're proving my point, Michael. I, you and I'm Michael. Your point. It's a case of point. So hold on. That's that's a pot that I made in ninth grade art class. It I, it was actually my only B in high school. <laughs> was was an art. And <laughs> you made it. And B you can see in why. art. I made a B in art, dude. She was like, that's terrible. That was supposed to be red, white, and blue, and we put it in the kiln, and it all changed colors. I didn't oh, my gosh. It. So anyway, so I'm just, I'm making your point for you, Josh. Okay, so here's 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 my <laughs> ultimate point. Michael and Michael are way more prophetic than I am. Like, way more prophetic than I am, right? Like, they get on stage, and they exercise the gift of prophecy. They've called people out. They've given them, hey, this is the collection of, you know, in your room, you've got a collection of hats, you know. Uh, I feel like this is going on in your life. I've seen them get spot-on prophetic words for, I don't know, probably under 100, but somewhere up in that number of people put together. 
you know, in that same amount of time that I've seen them do those things, I've, I've given three prophetic words. Okay. You know, so, but I am way more artistic. I'm way more musically inclined. That doesn't make me prophetic. Right. And just because your worship pastor is up there with a guitar doesn't make them a prophet. They might be a teacher and it's just, okay. Now I think there is a connection with you, music. Hold on, but Josh, go ahead. There, there is like, I mean, maybe a connection between like elder and premature graying. Like you might mm. actually be able to be an elder sooner. Uh, if that were true, I would have been an <laughs> elder at 14 because that's when I started getting my first grays. Look at this, guys. Dude. Look at this. Oh, Look at this. Dude, so no solid. elder. No elder of any church ever. <laughs> anyway. Oh, dude. So we disagree with the with the personality uh, personality view for sure. And and this really brings us to our conclusion. And we've kind of been saying this all along, Josh, but basically uh, grace gifts. And I'm just going to read this straight from our notes. It, this, this view suggests that the list of gifts of Ephesians 4 is simply it's a it's random representatives of the many and various spiritual gifts bestowed by the Spirit and are no different from the kinds of gifts list, listed in First Corinthians twelve and Romans twelve. God supplies grace through a manifestation of the Spirit to empower and equip His church. So, Josh, that's your paragraph that you wrote there, and I pretty much agree with it, um, with the slight variation that I think there might be some kind of prioritization going on here because of the match to First Corinthians twelve twenty eight. But man, that's that's pretty theoretical. It's not something that I would. It's, it's definitely not a hill that I would die on. And if there is a prioritization going on, it is definitely not because these are offices. It is definitely not because these are authoritative in some way, but because some of the people who are, say, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, are called to be equippers in the body of Christ. And I didn't say apostles because there's just too much to discuss there, and there's only seven more minutes in the show. But uh, Anyway, yeah, so that's, yeah, but anyway, so that, that would be maybe a distinction, but basically the big picture that Josh and I a hundred percent, uh, agree on is that these are charismata. These are gifts of the Holy spirit manifest in people. And it just means for somebody to be a prophet simply means that they are prophetically gifted. With, even with that said, Josh, and I'll say that cause I, I, I liked that Mike Bickle said this when we were talking with Mike Bickle. He said, I don't call anyone an apostle. I don't right. call anyone a prophet. He's like, he's like, I don't even, he's like, Bob Jones predicted dates and comments. And I won't call him a prophet. You know, I don't know if that's a, a half decent Mike Bickle impersonation. Bridal glory. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, I always some... feel like I, I end up sounding like Lou Engle when I try to impersonate Mike Bickle. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, I like that because what I think that he's getting at and, and coming against is this massively American thing and Western thing to have to put a title on a business card. That's and right. it's honestly like it's godless. It, it is very worldly. I mean, that's why Jesus will say, like, don't let anyone call you rabbi or teacher or father. And uh, he's coming against this unholy desire for a title. And, uh, and, and so I like that from Bickle. He would just rather say this person was prophetically gifted. Now, I don't think it's sinful to do it because the Bible does label some people prophets, does label some people apostles. Sure. And far more than the circle of 12 apostles, as some erroneously claim. Um, so I'd, I wouldn't call it sinful, but I would call it safe. And I, and I, I actually like that as a, a form of safety and just saying, you know what? God gives grace gifts to the body of Christ. And some people who are particularly proficient, perhaps you might call them a prophet or an evangelist, but uh, I'm not ever going to call myself any of those things personally. Yeah. And I think that that's probably helpful because again, we have the character that defines those things. What, what we need, when, when the Bible says prophet, uh, I'm understanding the Bible to say, this is a person who exercises the gift of prophecy frequently. And uh, that's probably the way that they understood it. Not as titles, not like prophet so-and-so or pastor so-and-so or apostle this or that. Paul always introduces himself as Paul and apostle. Like This is what I do, not who I am, right? And I think that we very much want to identify with that. And I think that when we talked about office language and role language, this paints our interpretation of ourself, of the text, uh, of various things around us that I, I think can be difficult and dangerous. Um, you know, I've had a couple of engagements with a good friend of mine. We see things a little bit differently on this subject, but one of the things that we, we constantly go back and forth on is, well, you're a teacher and that's how teachers interpret this text. And I go, no, 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 
there's one way to interpret this text, and that's the correct way Thank to you. interpret this text. We don't have an <laughs> apostolic, you know, uh, mandate. Like we don't have like an apostolic view of the Great Commission or a teaching view of the Great Commission. There's one Great Commission, right? And and we start getting into like identity politics and applying it to fivefold ministry and say, you know. The charismatic movement is just full of prophets and apostles and the Bible church movement is just full of teachers and, you know, the fellowship, you know, seeker sensitive churches are just full of pastors and we start reducing, yeah. yeah, we reduce these gifts out to their baseline. Oh, that's where I see these gifts in operation. It's like, okay, just because there is a, um, a personality or a, a value system that is in that community that only values these certain gifts, it doesn't mean that that whole community is only composing of those specific gifts. If I'm in the most charismatic church in the world, I guarantee you God has supplied grace for teaching. Even if that gift hasn't been fade, fanned into flame, it's present mm -hmm. in that church. And I, I just, Absolutely. I want, I want people to hold and believe that God is giving grace to his church to accomplish all that he's purposed us to do. And we can't make excuses that, oh, our church is just grace this way. That church is just grace that way. And these are our personality types. We, we shouldn't be doing that. We should really be pressing on to fulfill that great commission with the power that Christ supplies. Uh, Michael, I hear you flipping. Should I keep ranting? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, no, I found it. So I, I wanted to, Josh, if you could pull up Jasmine, Jasmine Patterson's question. And we're going to, guys, we're going to tie up this episode here in a minute. We're going to do... Uh, we're going to record an interview right after this with Isaiah Saldivar. It's going to be a fantastic episode, but uh, he's going to be waiting for us in just a couple minutes. So I'm going to ask this question uh, or answer it, and then Josh, maybe we'll make a closing thought. But um, here's what she says. She says, can you elaborate on how we would define the gift role of pastor or shepherd biblically and how that is distinct from or similar to the role of elder? Yeah, that's a really important question, and, um, and because... When a lot of people look at this, and it's not just charismatics and the new apostolic reformation, and we've done episodes on that. It's not just charismatic. A lot of people read these texts as authoritative, and when they come to that word pastor, they think this definitely means authoritative pastor This and teacher. This definitely means authoritative teacher, and he's definitely talking about elders in the church. And, um, and I would say the text doesn't say that. The text doesn't say that this is talking about an authoritative, like, like it doesn't say that it's talking about elders right here. And, um, and so there is, what I would say is this, every elder must be a pastor, but not every pastorally gifted person must be an elder in the church. Okay. Let me say that again. Every elder, elder must be a pastor. That's Acts uh, chapter 20 where he talks about pastoring or shepherding the flock that, over which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. There's 1 Peter 5, where uh, Peter exhorts elders to shepherd the flock amongst them. So every elder, by requirement, must be a shepherd to the congregation. Okay, But does that mean that God couldn't possibly give a pastoring, shepherding gift to anyone else in the body except people who aspire toward the office of elder. I don't think so. I think that people who are not elders can have shepherding pastoral gifts. And, uh, and you say, well, what would that look like? Well, here's what, here's the passage I was turning to. This will speak in the, in the negative sense, but you can invert this and determine what the role of an elder or a shepherd, I should say, is because this was against the shepherds of Israel. A prophecy from Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34, uh, he says to the bad shepherds, he says, the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Okay, so what is the role of a shepherd? It's to strengthen the weak, it's to heal the sick, it's to bind up the injured, it's to bring back the strays, it's to chase down the lost. Okay, so th those are the things that a shepherd does. Now, could somebody be gifted in those activities? Somebody uh, who has just heart that beats for the sheep and uh, who is, I mean, who just does those things very proficiently. Josh, I would say yes. I would say that there are people like that. And, and Josh, here's why that matters to me. Okay. Uh, so I'm a complementarian, as is Josh. 
I'm a complementarian, so I believe in male headship in the church as well as in the home. Uh, with that said, I don't see a Bible verse that says every single shepherding gift that God gives in a church must only be given to a man and is only given to men who are in elder positions. To me, that's actually a conflation of the gift in the office, the very thing that we're trying to avoid doing. And the very oftentimes complementarians who would attack me for this position will actually try to make the same point about the other side of the Ephesians 4.11 passage and say, hey, there's no office of apostle today. And so uh, anyway, I'm not going to get lost in the apostle discussion. I'm, I'm simply going to say some of the most pastorally gifted people that I've known have been females. So at my church, we do have some female pastors. Uh, we do have an all-male elders board. That is an office. That is for governing, overseeing the affairs of the church. We believe that is reserved for males. That's part of my complementarian position. We have lots of videos on complementarianism. But I do believe that God gifts women in shepherding. Yeah. And I don't love the idea of, I mean, because this is just what I've observed. Uh, in a lot of churches, I mean, pretty much everyone can identify this. I mean, women are, are just very, I mean, there are just a lot of really gifted women. And in a lot of churches, they're just not given the title pastor for the simple reason that they're not, uh, that they're a woman. However, they're doing loads of pastoring and we just call them a director instead. And I'm like, is that really what first Timothy two was about? Like we we're, we're just going back to the titles thing. And I just think we get too lost in this titles. There are two offices in the church, elder deacon. Yeah. And keep it simple. Um, anyway, no, so I, I agree with I, you. I went I agree a little with you, rant Michael. there, but, We're, but I, I felt like it was important. No, I think, I think so too. I mean, one of the easy things for teacher, uh, that's one, it's the reason it's so easy is you go, uh, it says women are to preach, teach, or exercise authority over men. But can women be gifted with the Ephesians 4 gift of teaching? Well, in Titus chapter two, older women are told to teach younger women, right? So, they're told to teach in one context, not to teach in another context. That speaks to role, right? But then it doesn't say that they can't be gifted. In fact, we have specific explanation in the text of Scripture in Acts of when women teach. So that, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Anyway, I digress. Guys, uh, lots of good stuff here. Uh, I enjoyed the video. We have to film with Isaiah. He's, he's probably been waiting for four minutes. So I got to let you guys go. I want to remind you, we're entirely crowdfunded. If you guys want to support the ministry, one-time gift on PayPal. You can give a recurring gift on Patreon. It's those five bucks a month to get access to extra content. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment or a like, subscribe, share the content around to your, to your people who think that the gifts of the spirit are personality types or offices. See if we can stir up some good conversation. Blessings, guys. And we hope uh, this episode has been edifying to you, even though we were just doing teaching. We'll see.